Well, welcome, Dan Quiggle, to Education Secrets. Anya, thank you for having me. And we're very excited to have you. Dan has an incredible background. He is a serial entrepreneur. He founded five different companies. He's also a keynote speaker, speaking on emotional intelligence, on leadership to CEOs across the country. And today he's going to give us some of these tips that he gives to top CEOs, how we can improve our parenting. He's also a father of three incredibly successful and uh, children who've pursued very different paths and passions. So we're really excited to learn more from him. So first of all, whenever we talk about parenting, I want to make it very clear. I never want to put myself in expert status. We're all learning. You know what I mean? It's such a struggle. And I was, I always think it's so interesting because in the end, I think we all kind of want to do the good things our parents did and try to stay away from the bad things we thought our parents did. <laughs> and so, you know, those are some of the, those are some of the rules that I follow. I just want the best for my children, just like all of us do. And, uh, you know, we're all, I, I hate to say winging it, but we kind of are, and we're just trying to make, make a difference in their lives and be a positive impact. Absolutely. And it is a learning curve. And you've had the benefit of years already, right? Your children are in their uh, in their 20s and one is in high school. Tell, tell us about your three kids. And uh, because it's very interesting, they all three have really pursued their passions and done incredibly well. Tell us uh, what they've done and how you help them actually support support them and have that confidence to pursue their dreams. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because we have these visions for our kids. Like this is what we want. You know, they're going to be a doctor. They're going to be a, a professional or a financial advisor or whatever that is, you know, and, and then life doesn't turn out that way sometimes. And it, that was, I think the hardest part early on for me was allowing them to follow their passions, not mine or not my wife's. And, and so we've had many discussions about that over the years on identifying your passion and what you care about and, and you know where you want to spend your time and how, the life that you want to live, and then matching that with something uh, that actually you can monetize to make a difference and in, in, in society and, and and actually make a living doing it. So I think with all three of my kids, from the 26 year old, the 24 year old, to the 17 year old, uh, we've had those deep discussions, and they've been allowed they've been allowed to do that, and they've been encouraged to do that. And uh, and so that's one of the things I'm most proud of. And then. Uh, along the way, making sure that they're appreciative for the opportunities that they have and thankful to others and caring for other people and, and loving for family, all those different aspects of, of, of a family environment. Well, tell us about Corinne, because she is a professional beach volleyball player. So you don't become a professional beach volleyball player just on a whim, right? It's, uh, it's I'm sure it was been a tremendous passion. It also required a tremendous amount of support probably from you as parents. Could you tell us a little bit about her journey? Yeah, so certainly proud of all three kids. It is interesting. Corinne, when she was 12 years old, you know, she's playing sports. We're all very athletic. We love sports. And uh, she was playing basketball and soccer. And at 12, she picked up a volleyball and everything else just kind of faded away, disappeared. And that ball was in her hand the whole time. And I'll never forget. She said, you know, she pulled me aside one day. And she goes, Daddy, I want to play in the Olympics and I want to become a professional volleyball player. And I was like, you know, you, you almost want to say like, that's good, little girl. And you could also become president of the United States of America. You know, because, but, but I could see in her eyes, you know, she was a very determined, strong young woman. And I remember I was like, OK, you seem serious about this. And she said, I am serious. And I said, then we need to have a serious discussion. And she goes, OK. And I said, this is never going to be my dream. It's it's your dream. So I'm never going to tell you to go to practice. I'm never going to tell you to do all these things because the second I start doing that, it takes it away from your dream and makes it mine. And so it's got to be, you know, it's got to be this internal drive and desire. And she said, you know, she essentially said, I have it. And, and she did. And, and so everything was kind of on her to make sure that, you know, she was going to practice and working hard enough and she would stay, you know, she'd come early and stay later. And she, I'll never forget, even in high school, like one time the coach left the gym and all the kids kind of sat down. And she was like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, the coach isn't here. And she's like, we want to get better. Like, we want to be champions. Like, let's, let's, let's act like, like leaders and let's, let's, you know, let's train. And they kind of all stood back up again and started training. Wow. And, and I just, wow. I, I love that, that she just has had this internal drive. And then, you know, sure enough, she, uh, you know, made it to college on a scholarship, which was very beneficial, of course, to the family. And then, um, you know, she ended up making it onto the pro tour and right now sitting top five, I think, in the USA and, you know, probably top, you know, just in, in the top group, even internationally. Um, and now she plays for the U.S. 
yeah, she plays for the U.S. team. And I'll be honest, one of my most proud moments just came a few weeks ago. She actually got chosen to be on an Armed Forces Entertainment trip and got to go uh, play beach volleyball in front of all of our troops over in the Middle East in, in Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Egypt, uh, Abu Dhabi, and just a, a, an 11 base tour. And I'm just so proud of that because I love this country. Uh, I love giving back. And it was all of those things put together, her passions. And she got to do that for our, for our great men and women over uh, serving the United States overseas. Because service is very important to you. Dan, you also served in as advisor to President Reagan, um, an extraordinary achievement. And probably when you raised your children, was service something that you really emphasized? Yeah, I, th I think that it's, it's about giving back. And I practiced this thing called success to significance. Like at some point you realize the full impact that you have over other people's lives, positive and negative, by the way. And so, you know, are, are you... Are you helping out, uh, you know, cleaning up trash on the beach or or serving in the community or, or maybe staying extra and helping out at church or what, whatever that is, whatever it is to yeah. you. But do you actually make that happen in your life? So we do something in my family called the Wooden Pyramid. So I know if, for those of you that don't know that, you can Google John Wooden, W-O-O-D-E-N, John Wooden. And John Wooden was the use, one of the greatest coaches of all time at UCLA. And he had a wooden pyramid. And on that uh, there's friendship and competitive greatness and all these different terms. But in my family, we actually build our own pyramid. And each one of us has an individual one. You know, we, we took a blank pyramid and filled the boxes uh, with words that are important to us. And then we create a family pyramid. And on the current Quiggle family pyramid, we have words like, you know, faith and integrity and fun and gratitude. But my 17-year-old puts service on there. And I'll, I'll never forget because I kind of turn to him and I go, oh, really? I don't see a lot of that going on right now in the Quiggle family because we're all kind of busy. You know, life <laughs> takes over. And so if it's going to go on there, it has to actually mean something. And so then what does it mean? Does it mean once a week, once a month, once a year? And, and, then, and then in what capacity? And so I just love having those type of discussions. And I encourage your listeners to maybe sit down and build a wooden pyramid, like talk about your current principles and values and what's important to you. And, and I'm, I'm very careful to say you can't change the past. So don't beat yourself up over what hasn't been done or what you haven't accomplished. You just change it today. You make it happen t this afternoon and then you just move forward. And then that becomes your new legacy. That becomes your new life. So really establishing and also even physically building it, uh, what would be your family culture, your family values, what you value as a family. That's a wonderful tip for parents. And uh, it's a lot what we actually discuss as well on, on our program on building your family's culture and philosophy. Well, tell us about your your other two kids uh, because they've all yeah. taken a little bit different <clears throat> paths. Uh. Yeah, no, they have. So I have this term like find your passion, mm -hmm. master it, and there will be enough crazy people on this planet to pay you to be the master of anything. So it could be chess, it could be computer gaming, it could be a sport. Um, but for my older son, Justin, I'm very proud of him because, you know, he graduated from Pepperdine University. He got a great job, um, you know, very lucrative job and just decided that that wasn't for him. He didn't want to sit behind a desk and he's a very active, engaging person. And so he um, was an ocean rescue lifeguard in Newport Beach, California. But then he, he wanted to be he wanted to fly. So he went and during COVID, you know, flew every day and got his commercial license and his his instructor's license and his dual engine license and, and started flying over um, over in Hawaii for Mokalele Airlines, island to island, living in Hawaii, <laughs> just living this great life. But on the side, he had applied for a job that he had been, you know, every year had applied for about a thousand people applied for it and they only choose six and, and he got it. And so he left Hawaii, came back to California and he's going to be an ocean rescue lifeguard. It's called permanent lifeguard for the state of California. Actually pays extremely well. It's like being the David Hasselhoff <laughs> They watch, you know, you kind of run the beach and, and it's four days on, three days off. It's just an incredible opportunity. And yeah. you know what I love the most about that? First of all, not only can he monetize it and make a great life for himself, but it's exactly what he loves. He, he, he loves challenges. He loves, you know, the medical side of that, the life-saving side of that. And, and it's all those things. He loves being outdoors and the sun and the fun. And, and so it's all those things that he loves. So he also has been able to follow his passion and then that leads us to this, this third child, this 17-year-old who's a senior in high school, being able to witness that, hey, 
it doesn't always have to be the traditional route. Mm. There are other alternatives. There are other choices. And so now I just feel like he feels like the, the world is his oyster. He's being recruited for water polo. He's looking at, you know, he's got like a 4.5 GPA. And, and believe me, look, we all have our challenges as parents. There's no doubt. So this is not all gravy and yeah. cream on top. Yeah. I mean, everybody goes, through, but a lot of it is, you know, that statement, you know, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. Things mm. happen all the time. But in those crisis moments for a family, we just don't let them define and defeat us ever. It, it, instead, we go a different route. We let those moments, you know, strengthen us and empower us to be the next best version of ourselves, to harden ourselves for the next battle. So I'm not saying that everything's all good or that we have this perfect situation. Of course not. No, th there is no probably real perfect. But I also, I like this statement, don't make the perfect, don't let the perfect, you know, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. In other mm -hmm. words, there's so much good out there that you could focus on. And when we search for perfect, it just it's just almost unattainable. So be okay with good and great and be happy uh, to the to the you know the to the greatest extent that you can be. That's wonderful advice, um, and uh, I think it seems like this is something you imparted on your children as well. So they didn't have a fear of failure. They were willing to try things, to go out of the box, to really pursue their passion. Yeah, so a hundred percent, Anya, and, and it's not only that, but I encourage them to fail. I mean, I really do. I, I encourage them to fail because I'm like, if you're not failing, you're not pushing hard enough. We're mm -hmm. all going to fail, but it, it's not failure if you learn something from it. I mean, I, I fail all the time in, in business and in life, but I, I just try never to do it again, you know, because I want to learn from that moment. And so I think those are the, the things that strengthen us and allow us to do that. And then the other thing is, and I think this just is very important, is the, is the appreciation part. It's, you know, and, and, I just didn't grow up with a lot. Like we, my dad didn't have a high school or college education, but my parents gave us tons of love. And so I knew that that was so strong. I didn't even know we were poor, but we were very poor. So now that we have resources, I want these kids to know that, hey, all of this is gravy on top. All of this can disappear. So we need to keep working. We need to keep adding value. We need to keep investing in each other and investing in our society and our community and other people around us. Because when you do stuff like that, and I'm a karma person, like do the right thing, it will come back to you tenfold. If it doesn't, who cares? You did the right thing to start with. And I, I just, I, I love having these discussions with the kids um, and allowing them to be kind of their own person, to make their own decisions, to live or, and die by their own decisions uh, and succeed and fail by their own decisions. And, and I think those are good conversations to have. It's, it's fun when you're able to do that with your children. Absolutely. And I know you've also created what is the Quiggle Assessment. It's um, a tool for CEOs and executives to find essentially their superpower, their strength. And I know you've also uh, used this on young, younger, on students, high school students, teens. Could you tell us a little bit about it and maybe how parents can use some of these techniques to try to figure out their child's superpower or passion or even just interests and talents? Yeah, so I'm on this mission to help kids find their purpose. I really am. And it's, it's, it's a passion for me because... I think there are a lot of kids out there that maybe some people don't tell them they're special or that they don't have that superpower. So instead, with when you take the Quiggle assessment, uh, you can actually, you take a test. It's a 21 question mm -hmm. test. I partnered with a social scientist. It's very uh, specific on, you know, what archetype you end up being. You can either be uh, the explorer, the creator, the guardian, the analyst, the royal, you know, the director, there's six archetypes. And then based on that, it helps you create a power pitch because so often we, we kind of think we are something and then we don't market ourselves correctly. So if you're the guardian, you're caring, compassionate, helpful, hopeful, own it. You're a servant leader, like be that person. Um, if you're the creator, you're bold, you're unique, you're out of the box. So own it, be that person. And I love that I've been doing this test and uh, for everyone, for everyone we, we sell, we donate one. And so I've been do able to donate uh, thousands now to inner city kids and to different groups. And I, I'll give you an example. I was at inner city LA. This kid comes up to me. He's like, I'm not a leader. I'm a rapper. And I'm like, rap for me right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know how, like when you just yeah. hear raw talent, you're like, did that just happen in front of me? Cause he was just so talented. And I said, I know which one you were before you tell me. And he goes, guess. And I said, you were the creator. And he goes, I was the creator. And I said, do you want to know why I know that? And he goes, why? And I said, because you are bold. You are unique. You are out of the box. 
be proud of that. And he looked at me and he goes, maybe I am a leader. I'm like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Because I'm like, you know, half the battle is just believing in yourself and just understanding that, that you have these abilities. And so by taking the test, it's not just the test to discover who you are and the science behind who you are, but it's also, it, it builds, it creates a power pitch for you. So let me give you an example. My son, who's 17, Eric, he, he was the creator. And it's, he's like, my name is Eric Quiggle and I deliver bold solutions. I'm cutting edge when it comes to technology. I think outside the box when it comes to leadership training. I try to take the previously unthinkable and make it a reality. If you're looking for bold solutions, I will deliver. Now, what's the alternative? I'm in the 12th grade. Swipe. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like it's incredible, just incredible, incredible. But, that, but that's what I mean. It's like how do you how do you discuss your value and 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 show your purpose to others? And then and then in part as part of that dream share with them and allow them to maybe help you with you know your they allow them to help you with your dream and allow yourself you know the opportunity to help them with their dreams. I mean, I think that's what society and life's all about. Mm -hmm. But this does, it seems that this is, uh, this would be so helpful for a young adult or a high school student, both in terms of gaining confidence and really understanding what their strengths are. And then at the same time, actually in, in terms of their branding process for college application, because at today college application in many regards, it's also about a kind of a sort of self branding, um, right? A hundred percent. I mean, so, so I've had, let me, let me just give you an example. We had a 22 year old kid that was living next to us here. And he said he was about to leave his job. He had been there for a year and a half. He wasn't perceived as a leader. He's like, I'm trying to leave, but nobody even sees me. So I said, hey, you should take my Quiggle assessment. So I give him a discount code. He takes the test. Two weeks goes by. I don't even talk to the guy. All of a sudden he comes over. He goes, I, I can't even tell you. I, I need to thank you. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, so I took the test. I memorized all of your language. I started talking like a leader. I started, you know, he was the director. So he's like, we need to be more purposeful. We need to be more entrepreneurial. He said, I've been there for a year and a half, nothing. Two weeks later from, from using your test, he goes, his boss came up and said, hey, you've really been stepping up as a leader. I'm going to give you a direct report and put you on the leadership path. He's like, this is amazing. But, but a lot of it, whether you are a middle school student talking to your teachers or friends, mm -hmm. whether you're a high school kid trying to get into college, whether you're a college student trying to get a job, whether you're in the business world trying to get a promotion or be seen more as a leader, we all need the tools to communicate our value. And that's what, why I created this test. And I, I just, I get so much great feedback from it. It's one of my, one of the things I'm most proud of just because I want to make that success to significance and I want to be significant in other people's lives. And if that's the opportunity to do it, heck yeah, like let's get it out there. That's why I love donating all the tests. You know, when, when we sell them, uh, we just keep donating more and more and more. And so my goal, if I can dream share right here on, on your, on your mm -hmm. program, it's literally to change 3 million lives over the next five years. I want to sell 1.5 million tests and donate 1.5 million tests and just try to make the biggest impact that we could possibly make. Oh, that's a wonderful goal. And that's a wonderful dream. And mm -hmm. setting goals and setting dreams is also very important, uh, a skill for us to teach to our children. Is this, uh, because naturally I see you do it, uh, of course, naturally. Is this something that you worked with with your children in terms of how to start thinking about their dreams and their goals? So, you know, it's interesting. Let me give you an example. So my wife was a teacher and her parents were teachers. And I love, I mean, I just have a place in my heart for teachers because I think they give and, and they're not probably compensated sometimes like they should be for, for all the time that they put in, the resources, everything. It's so personal when you're a teacher. Um, but there also has to be a realization, like if you're going to be a teacher, you know how much you're going to make. If you're going to, you know, so if you, if you have this dream of living in this mega mansion mm -hmm. and then you take a different job, you just have to be realistic about the expectations. I'm not saying one's good or bad. It's a complete yes. opposite. I'm just saying be realistic. So you have to kind of match where the life that you want to live, the time that you want off. So, so teachers may want to be a teacher because they can see the impact that they make in every child's life. I mean, how rewarding is that? And then maybe you get summers off. Who knows? I mean, that may be an, you know, so, so you're, you're kind of trading off certain things for certain things along the way. So when I talk to my kids, I'm always saying, be realistic in your planning. Like, make sure that you are understanding, like, the outcome of the work that you're putting in. And again, no right or wrong, but it kind of goes back to, I have some business partners and they always say, like, if it's not going to make money, then it's a hobby, not bad mm -hmm. to have hobbies, but then just define it as a hobby. Like this is a hobby and this is my business. This is how I pay for my family or this is how I, 
add value here. This is how I make a difference in society. It is what it is. So I'm just very, I, I call myself like a realistic planner. Mm. When I talk to the kids about that, just make sure that you have an actual set of goals that you are trying to achieve them and that you also um, realize that they're going to change. We talk about this all the time with the kids, like economies change, opportunities change, doors open, doors close all the time. When I have my, I have a podcast, Garage mm -hmm. to Goliath, and we talk about this all the time. And this has been proven. Real leaders set goals very differently than anyone else. And I'm, I'm going to share with you the mm -hmm. secret if you don't mind. Please. They, they set very lofty goals, but here's the differentiator between them and everyone else. Ready? They then show everyone around them their role in it. And here's the kicker. What do they get out of it? Not what do I get out of it? Not what does my company get out of it? Literally, what do they get out of it? Because then and only then can all these people around you be involved in that dream and feel passionate about it because now they not only know that they matter in it, but they get something out of it. And it always doesn't have to be monetary. It could be a new promotion or a new title or whatever it is, but it could also be monetary and financially driven. But whatever it is, it's real leaders are visionary leaders. They set a vision that everyone around them wants to be part of, that wants to support. Mm -hmm. And with your kids, it's the same thing. I mean, when Corinne had that dream at 12, I'm like, let's map it out. How does it look? Where do you play? Where do you want to go to school? How do you get into the pros? Like, well, let's start looking at other people who have done that. What, what, what was their path? And then, and then let's see if you can interview some of those people. Talk to them. Mm -hmm. What were their you know, trials and tribulations and, and, and opportunities and what do they think they would have done differently? And so we just we try to just really immerse ourselves in that in that opportunity and, and learn as much as we can, because the one thing that I want to do is go to bed just a little bit smarter each day. You know, what I mean, just a little bit smarter. And so I want to learn something, whether that's a language, whether it's about business, whether it's about, you know, whatever it is, I want to I want to be smarter every day and I want my kids to do the same, to be lifelong learners. Lifelong learners. Absolutely. And I also wanted to speak with you about you. You've written an excellent piece on your blog about the eight parenting tips uh, uh, for parents. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about them because I have to say, you know, each one uh, encompasses so much. Each one could be, you know, an article or a book in itself. But maybe you can give us some uh, some hints uh, as we walk through them. So your first parenting tip is really to walk the walk and uh, essentially to model for your children, right? What you expect from them. Yeah. So I think that they're watching everything. I mean, they see everything. They see when you are positive. They see when you are negative. They see when you yell. They see when you curse. I mean, just to give you a micro example of this, okay? In my speech on emotional intelligence to CEOs, I talk about situational awareness. And during that part of the speech, I say, I'm about to make a statement. And I almost guarantee there'll be people in this room that will disagree with me. And I say, guess what? That's what's great about America. We can agree <laughs> to disagree, but I'm on a personal mission to stop this one. And then I say, I'm on, I think it's completely unacceptable for you to curse in your personal or business life, period, end of story. And you can kind of see the grumbling in the crowd. I said, think about it. I said, and this is not coming from a halo over my head, holier than thou attitude. It's literally like, what's your personal brand? Because if you're the leader of a company, your employees, your managers are watching you. And that's how you're, they're going to talk to your employees when you're not around. Same thing in a family. Like when you, when you are cursing, that's how your kids are going to talk to their friends, to your grandchildren someday, because you, the leader, just did it. And that's how real leadership looks and sounds like to them. So that's how they're going to be. So I just ask, like, is that what you want? And it's so interesting because we were at a water polo match and we're pull, you know walking out and there's mom's got four little kids in her car, probably 11 to six. She's on her cell phone and she's like, mother. And she's, you know, she's <laughs> cursing. And I'm like, wow, because that's how those kids are going to talk to her grandchildren someday. And, and so I just ask you, you know, to, to your listeners, like, what do you want your personal brand to be? Are you walking the walk? Because they're listening to you. You're the leader. You're setting the standard for the brand and the brand is the family culture. So as a parent, you really have to think of yourself as a leader. You have to think of yourself in those terms, right? Absolutely. You are the leader. I mean, they're looking up to you. And by the way, you're supposed to be acting like a leader. I mean, I know we kind of want to be their friend, but in the end, we have to make tough decisions. And that's why for, you know, if you're a single parent out there, you know, it, it's challenging because you got to be the good cop and the bad cop and the Uber driver and the, and the counselor and all these other different things. You know, when you have two parents, at least maybe you can, Every once in a while, 
go back and forth, yes. but those tough decisions still have to be made. And so I just still, my dad used to say a term all the time. He'd say, you know, I wouldn't do it if I didn't love you. And I used to think, well, then don't love me so much. You know, so like, you know, but later on in life, I realized how true that was. Like he cared that I was home at a reasonable time. He cared that I was safe. He cared that. And so a lot of these decisions, I have these discussion with the kids. I will say this. There's a question that I ask when I'm speaking. I say, do you have CEO disease? And I ask that to kids running a club or anybody else. But when you're a parent, and, and I say, what does that mean? It, it means where you walk in a room, you're like, they love me. They think I'm hilarious, you know, all this stuff. And really they're saying like, I'm sick of hearing their stories or about how their kids are great because my kids are on drugs. And I just can't tell you that because it'll make me look like a bad parent. You know, that's, that's probably what they're, they're really saying. Some of them, but I say, how do you know if you have CEO disease? And then I say, I get feedback one-on-one. -on -one. I'll call somebody in my office and I'm like, Hey, shut the door. So I want to be the best version of myself. I'm going to ask you a question. You're not going to lose your job because of it. And then I say, what should I do more of, less of, add? And then I shut up and I listen. Well, what's interesting about that, Anya, is that I have asked that question of my kids from the time they were five. I mean, I sit them down all the time. I'm like, hey, you know I want to be the best dad. And there's no perfect plan out there. So I'm going to make mistakes all the time. I'm admitting it right now. Like, I'm going to make horrible mistakes, I'm sure. But I want to be the best version. So I'm going to ask you a question right now. Just answer me honestly. What should I do more of, less of, add? And I will tell you that for what, 20 some years now, those have led to some really interesting, fun, deep conversations and, and real conversations. And it's funny because, you know, when they're younger, they're like, I think you should let me eat ice cream more often. You're like, okay, that's not going to happen. You try, you know what I mean? But when they get older, they become more meaningful conversations. Like, hey, that joke you tell about me, stop it. It's embarrassing. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, do I want to embarrass my kids? If you're one of these parents out here, and I'm just gonna I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a risk and say this, that says I love embarrassing my kids. I, I just don't. Life's hard enough. You know, the last thing I wanna do is embarrass my kids. I wanna empower my kids. I wanna believe in my kids. I wanna support my kids. I wanna love my kids, but I do, I, I'm not in the, in the business of embarrassing my kids. And, and I hope that, you know, you can at least, if you, if you do that or you say that, you can think that through. But I love having that question because it just gives you an opportunity to have real conversations about leadership, about mistakes, about all these things. So you're basically doing like a 360 review as you would in a corporate job. And you do that as a dad with your kids. I think that's a wonderful tip to take from the leadership and, uh, you know, corporate world into your home. You have another tip. Um, it's also very concrete, something you do, a habit. Uh, essentially what you call a warm welcome home. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Okay, well, I, first of all, I can't take credit for this. So this is all, all my wife's doing and it started probably 20, you know, 20 plus years ago. So imagine my, my wife's having a conversation with a friend of ours and he said that when he got home each day, the only thing that greeted him was the dog. And she just felt so sorry for him because she's like, how sad is that? You know, this person's out working hard all day, comes home and nobody even cares whether he gets home. So she just started this thing where if you walk in the door of our home, whoever is home, it could even just be one person. Like if, if it's my son, Justin, like he'll walk through the door and everybody's like, Justin's home, Justin's home, everybody, Justin's home, like yelling through the whole house, like from upstairs, downstairs, like, the, and I will admit, <laughs> don't laugh. It feels so good that if I ever was down and depressed, I'd probably just walk out and come back in again. It feels that good. It just, it's just a positive moment. And, 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 you know, it could just be one person in the house. Like I'll come home and just our 17 year old be in the house. He's like, dad's home, dad's <laughs> home, everybody. Dad's home. Well, it's just him, but it just feels good. So I, I just encourage you to create that kind of atmosphere in your home where people feel welcome. They feel, you know, excited to be there and they feel appreciated. And you do and, that and for each other. Right. I mean, that's yeah, wonderful. All of you us, everybody does it for everybody in the family. It just kind of stuck, you know, and we've been doing it ever since. So. so another tip you give is to create a safe space in your home, to create um, but essentially like a non-judgmental atmosphere. Could you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, so I, th I think that it's important to, to realize that we're all going to make mistakes, that we're all mm -hmm. going to have different opinions, and for them not to be able to talk about those opinions in the house. You know, I have very strong political opinions. I have very strong business opinions, very strong mm -hmm. principles, you know, and, and again, make mistakes all the time. But here's the reality. I want 
diversity of thought in my life. And I encourage the kids to have the same. So I will tell them, I'm going to tell you what I think. And then I encourage you to go listen to your teachers because you're probably going to hear something different or listen to other friends because you're probably going to hear something different. And then in the end, I'm not going to be around. You're going to have to make a decision for yourself. And those are just fun conversations to have. So I, I, I don't want the same information beaten into my head over and over and over again. I always want to question things, not for the, not just to be devil's advocate, but just to, to, to just make sure that I have the best possible information. Because I think real leadership requires you to listen to all sides and then be able to make a, a solid decision based on all the information that you have. If you have blinders on and you're only listening to the same news station, the same thing, reading the same articles from the same people every day, it's just hard to get that kind of diversity of thought. So we've encouraged that within the family. And, you know, so far it's turned out great because I think they feel like we're not trying to, you know, force feed them anything. We're literally trying to get them to get the best information. So you're really developing critical thinking skills, you can say, in your children, right? By asking them to be open to different opinions, to assess them, to be able to express their own opinions. Yeah. And, and then and then read and, you know, and read, read as much as you can, like read a lot about, you know, politics and economics and cultures. I mean, and, and then, you know, to the best of your ability, and some people have the research, some people don't, you know, there's nothing that can beat traveling too. I mean, traveling to other countries to see, you know, sometimes just how fortunate we are to, 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 to live where we are, to have the freedoms that we do. Um, you know, it's very different in China. Like, you know, my daughter's played many times in China, so we've been there many times. It's just a different culture, not good or bad, just very different. Well, and, I mean, sometimes with the freedom's bad, but you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just a different culture. So there's an appreciation side to that for different cultures, for different backgrounds, to make sure that we um, understand kind of where we are and the opportunities that we have. Well, what are some of the things you can do with younger children? Because it may seem to some listeners that, well, you know, reading... Uh, newspapers or discussing politics. Maybe that's something I'll do with my kids when they're in high school. But how can you start earlier and you know, impart these same values of critical thinking, uh, lack of judgment, having an open mind and learning? Yeah. So I think, you know, it goes back to um, in our family, we do something called education nights. This is one of my favorite things that we do. So everybody gets a night and you have to teach the family something in 15 to 30 minutes, and you can only use YouTube. Only YouTube. So you have to. So, so we use videos. So they don't have to say anything. They could just tee up five, three five-minute videos on something they care about. And there are some rules to this. You, it can be anything they're interested in, anything whatsoever. And you can't judge the other person. So they could show you, like, their favorite video game and how it works. They can show you their favorite band and, like, what they sound like. But you just watch them and you learn about them. Or So like my younger son just did like the U.S. mission to Mars. He just did uh, one on how to live to be 100. And they found all these centurions all around the world. And he just showed us three videos of how they ate and how they did different things. Um, I've done like what is blockchain or what is cryptocurrency? You know, it was so you just teach. So it, it's taking it down to that level of the child. I guarantee you there are tons of videos designed for kids that talk about government or talk about economics or talk about supply chain or talk about whatever it is you're interested in teaching them. And it's just right at our fingertips. But it does take a few minutes to go yeah. find it, tee it up and show it to somebody. But it's like anything. When you invest in people and it's real and there's love surrounding it, good things are going to come out of it. Even if they don't learn a single thing, they see the effort that you went through to try to make it happen. But I have a strong feeling they're going to learn something new and it's going to spark some interest or some excitement or maybe even someday some passion that they want to pursue. And that's what this is all about. And this leads well to one of your tips in terms of encouraging your children's dreams, not your own. And we started yeah. with this discussion as well. But to what extent were you able you know, to step back um, let's say, and, uh, you know, when it comes to academics. So you can say, well, maybe for some kids, you know, academics is not their dream. But at the same time, as a parent, you do feel like you have to encourage academics to a degree, right, and learning. So how did you manage that with your children? And what, what advice would you give to parents um, to, in, in one hand, you remain, uh, you know, the guardian and the parent who opens opportunities and doors and provides guidance, and at the same time doesn't overstep and still allows your child, their children to follow their own dreams. So this is an interesting one because, mm -hmm. so again, you know, from the beginning, we talked about this, we have this vision for our kids 
And by the way, we don't even want them to be what we were. We want them to be what we thought we wanted to be. You know, so does that make sense? Yeah. Like it was, you know, this vision of ourselves, like all the things that we didn't accomplish, we want them to accomplish. That's why these these parents with sports are so driven. But I just, I think it's it's okay to have conversations like let's start with sports saying, hey, what do you want to play? What do you have fun playing? I mean, I did this whole podcast with Holly McPeak, former Olympian beach volleyball player. Um, now she's a broadcaster where we came up with a guide for parents. And maybe I'll give, I'll give, I'll send it yes. to you uh, for a sports guide, um, a link that you can give to your listeners. It's free, of course. But just to say, what do you want me to say on the side of the court? Like when I watch Corinne play volleyball, are you ready for this? I have three or four approved sayings that I can yell. <laughs> that she's approved, right? <laughs> yes, she's approved. No, seriously. I'm, I'm like, what? what's not going to stress you out? So I can say, come on, let's go, side out. Like those those are pretty much it. So I'm always like, come on, let's go, Corinne, side out. You know, so because <laughs> to give you an example, we have this other friend um, who, who he's never played volleyball his entire life. His daughter's playing beach volleyball on a professional tour. And he's like, pull, pull. You know, he's giving advice and she wants to... <laughs> I want to stop in the middle of the match and turn and be like, really? <laughs> so, Dad, based on all of your years' experience, you think I should pull off the net? You've never played volleyball in your entire life. But, you know, so it's just having those fun conversations. Yeah. On, on, the, on, the, on the, the grade side and the other side, I think it's, you know, from the time the kids were little, when grades started to matter in middle school, because I think middle school is a defining moment, isn't it? Kind of, mm-hmm. kind of they, they either find their good friends or they bad friends. I mean, for me, middle school, that's where the kind of the good kids stayed good and the bad kids went bad. And so I think, you know, friends matter, who they're friends with. So being in tune with that is very important. But I always would pull the kids aside and I say, hey, can I tell you the secret to life? All these kids who are messing around, who are goofing off, who think they're cool, when the college acceptance letters come, they're gonna realize that they made the biggest mistake of their life because the hard work done early in middle school and high school gets paid off when you get accepted to any school you wanna go to. Now you get to go have real fun in college and enjoy and you know choose the classes, the schedules, all these things. So the secret to life is work hard early, reward later. And, and uh, they kind of bought into that. You know what I'm saying? So they, you know, they all did really well in high school and middle school. And then their reward was they got to kind of go wherever they wanted to go. And, and I think, you know, all three of them have kind of pulled me aside separately and be like, hey, thank you for that. Like, thank you for that mm-hmm. advice. Like that has mm-hmm. turned out well because, you know, my friends who thought they were so cool now are going nowhere or they, they don't have those opportunities. And I don't mean nowhere, nowhere, but I'm just saying to the college yes. that, of their dreams. Um, so it is interesting. And so I just think that having real conversations with them on a regular basis. And, and Ani, you know, as, as I'm going through this, I'm just thinking like, it's almost like imposter syndrome. Like, who am I to give this advice? I've only given this advice because again, like I'm just telling you the things that I, I thought have really worked well over the years. So I don't want to come across as this like holier than now expert because that's not the case. I mean, again, make mistakes all the time, but I definitely want to be the best father that I can be. I definitely love these kids. I want to invest in these kids and I want them to feel that support all the time. Like you can always bring a problem here. I, I call it circle the wagons. It's, it's it's a part of this list. You know, there's no problem too big that you can't bring into this house. Every, every problem has a solution right here. And it may be a hard one. It may be a tough one. I mean, we may even, you know, you may get in trouble a little bit, but again, nothing that's going to, that's going to define or defeat you. Everything is just going to empower and strengthen us to be the best father, son, daughter, wife, mom, you know, all these different things along the way. I mean, this is wonderful advice. Um, And it's, again, it's how to create that loving environment in your home and also the commitment that you make as a parent, because that's a very big commitment. Um, And throughout all these tips that you've discussed, at the end of the day, it's the responsibility and commitment you take on as a dad, as a mom uh, for your kids. Um, you also have another tip, a uh, very concrete one, what you do with your family, that you schedule a meeting. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yes. So so actually, this this is a, a more recent one. So this has not been all along the way. So what I found was, especially like with my older son, when he was kind of deciding where he wanted to end up, and with my daughter, you know, with her sports, she has sponsors, um, you know, that sponsor, because of course, beach yes. volleyball isn't like tennis or golf. There's not huge money in that sport, but you can... You can make a decent living, but they have sponsors. And so I felt like I was always like, you know, have you sent your resume out to, you know, for my older son? Have you, have you, to my daughter, like, have you called those sponsors? Like, you know, I was always 
I don't want to say nagging, but probably nagging. Okay, let's just let's just call it for what it is. You know, just talk on them all the time. And and finally one day I just I thought this isn't right. Like I, I want to be a dad. So I literally called the kids together and I said, from here on out, if you want to talk business or talk about your futures in that regard from a professional standpoint, you can schedule a meeting with me. Otherwise, I'm just going to be your dad. I'm just going to love you and just, you know, care for you and support you just like a, a normal dad would. But because uh, I just it's too much pressure on me, on you. And I think they were, you know, probably to a point where they're like, come on, stop it. Like, quit, quit talking about that all the time. It has completely transformed all the relationships. And by the way, they have scheduled so many meetings with me, which is awesome because, and then it's, it's time like, okay, I have from two to three and we'll, we can talk about the following, you know, give me kind of an itinerary, like what are we going to talk about? And then that's the schedule. We talk about that and it's very meaningful. It's very intentional. And so I like that. So I just call it schedule a meeting where it just, you're not kind of nagging your kids all the time. Because if you're on them all the time, they probably don't want to see you. <laughs> they probably don't want to <laughs> hang out with you. They probably don't want to be around you. So give space to be a loving parent and then give space to, to, to talk details. Mm -hmm. But but to the best of your ability, whether it's just in your mind or an actual schedule like we do, mm -hmm. um, schedule a meeting. How old do you think uh, the kids have to be where they're ready for schedule a meeting? Uh, you said this has been more recent with, with your own family, so your kids are a little older. Do you think this is something you can introduce in elementary school or? Oh, I definitely think you can. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it, it may take some time to cultivate but and, mm -hmm. and to take, but I will say this, so often we underestimate these little kids. I'll give you an example. I was speaking in Florida at a big event and I see the CEO, this mom, and she, she had her two little kids with her that day. They were eight and 10. And, and I remember I, she had set them up outside with like, a, you know, they were working on something. <laughs> and I, I noticed them out outside of the, the, this big hall where I was speaking, this big um, conference center. And I said, are the kids coming in? And she said, oh, no, 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 they're, they're not. And I said, oh, no, 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 definitely bring them in. Bring them in for sure. Like all the stuff I talk about today, I guarantee you they'll be able to pick up on and just like I talk about the CEO of self, like you are the CEO of yourself. You're the leader of your own life, of your own mm -hmm. destiny. I would want my own kids in this meeting. She goes, are you serious? Okay, I'm bringing them in. So she brings them in. Oh my, these kids raised their hand. They answered questions and this was not a small crowd. And they they read me their uh, success story that they wrote through the Quiggle assessment that we created right there in the class. But the best takeaway from that, that again, just warms my heart. I, I love every second of it is that I see on Facebook because she had friended me on Facebook that she had posted she said, you know, sometimes your life changes in a moment. And she said, um, we heard this world-class speaker today, blah, blah, blah. Um, but he invited my kids in. She said, they listened to him for three hours, three hours. She said, they went straight home and started a lawn business, used their talking points from the Quiggle assessment, <laughs> went door to door and got two clients that afternoon. And, and she said, it, whether it was just budding entrepreneurism or whatever, or believing in yourself, the sky's the limit. You have to believe in yourself, in your own opportunities. And so, you know, allowing them that opportunity, it was just so much fun. And so I definitely think it can, it can start early on. Um, I definitely think that we underestimate kids and we should, we should put them in more responsible situations, give them the, the chance to fail and succeed and, and, and feel what that feels like. Absolutely. And, and not, absolutely. I couldn't cool. agree with you more. Don't un underestimate the children. Don't assume, well, they're still too young. This is not for kids. And then wait until they're certain in high school or whenever to introduce certain subjects, because then it honestly gets more difficult if they haven't been introduced to these concepts, these ideas, this way of thinking much earlier on. So absolutely. Yeah. And I've, I've definitely had experiences like this with my own children in terms of taking them to documentary films which, you know, it's not my children are elementary aged, so that you would maybe naturally assume, well, this is not quite for them, but, you know, they were able to engage with the materials, they're able to assess and have a discussion, an intelligent discussion afterwards. So I think that's a, that's a wonderful tip. So essentially all the, all the lessons you can learn as a CEO or that you teach to CEOs, you can equally apply to children as young as uh, elementary school years, wouldn't you say? I, I really would. And, and, you know, it's, there's maybe different stories that you tell around those things so that they, they relate. So I would say, just be cautious to the stories that you tell so that the kids can kind of relate to them. But again, you know, sometimes I'll tell some very adult sounding stories and, and there's good takeaways from them. 
and and those kids get it out of there. So I would say definitely like invest in them, try try it, see what happens. But that's why I love those education nights because you just never know what they're going to get out of it. And and so when you're trying to teach, you, if you want to learn something and be better at it, teach it, right? So that's kind of gives them an opportunity to do that and be the, the master of their own domain and kind of choose and what they're interested in and then feel like they're teaching it to somebody else. Absolutely. And you also give um, one of your tips, which I think is, you know, follows very well, is that realize that your children are tomorrow's leaders and you have to start instilling some of the leadership uh, characteristics and traits in your children early on. Could you tell us a little bit more? So let me give you an example. So Corinne, my daughter who plays mm -hmm. volleyball, she coaches young young girls like how to on volley, beach volleyball. And this happened just the other day. She was out on, on, on the sand and uh, this little girl was looking at her and they were they were on a break and she goes, the little girl said to Corinne, she goes, do you party all the time? And Corinne said, no, I don't. I, I train all the time. And she said, you don't party all the time. This, she was just a little girl. And uh, Corinne said, no, I have very specific goals and I, I'm working toward those goals and I can't party all the time because I wouldn't do that to my body. I'm trying to be as healthy as I can be because I need my body to perform mm -hmm. and my mind to perform. And the little girl goes, my, my sister's the same age as you. She parties all the time. And so Corinne said, well, that's a choice that she makes. And I, I just try to make a different choice. She goes, you can make a different choice. And the little girl goes, I'm confused. And she kind of smiled. And I just, I love that moment because I said, Corinne, what did you think about that? And she goes, wow, I could be a big influence in that girl's life. And I said, you already are. You already are a big influence. So when I talk about their tomorrow's leaders, they're leading right now sometimes because classmates are watching them on how they talk about their teacher, or how they talk about their mom or their dad or their family. So let me give you an example. You know, my son, my son in high school goes, this, and this just happened yesterday, by the way. So my son in high school goes to, a, you know, it's a public school, but it's a great public school. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that there was a couple of students in his English class and they were bad mouthing the school. They're like, this is a horrible school. We have a horrible school. And, and Eric said, hold on just a second. This is one of the best public schools in America. We have great teachers here. Like we have tons of opportunity, great sporting events. Why are you even talking like that? And they go, well, okay, maybe, maybe it is okay. Mm -hmm. So it would be easy for him to just kind of say like, that's the way it is, but that's not the way it is. So just standing for what you believe in, saying what you really think. I mean, I was proud of him for standing up and not just going with the group and trying to be negative or whatever, but saying, hey, we're fortunate. And, and because we are. And, and I, I, I was so proud of him for that moment because it's little things like that. It's standing, you know, standing strong, communicating your values, um, you know, not bowing to peer pressure, not allowing others to dictate your emotions. I posted something that I said, when you allow others to affect your emotions, you give them all the power. So are you willing to give people the power like that to, to dictate how you feel in every day? I'm just not willing mm -hmm. to do that. And so I have to deal with, hor you know, horrible stuff all the time in business and life. I mean, things happen. But I'm not going to let those things completely define me and defeat me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, try to be better from them, be stronger from them, and move forward. And I think we all had a test of that, right, uh, of things happening to us for the past two years, <laughs> more than two years now with, with the pandemic. But part of your um, leadership, you know, the point you make about that your children are tomorrow's leaders is you also encourage parents to start teaching kids about accountability, about negotiation skills, about communication skills early on, right? Because these are very important skills they'll need in the future as leaders. Yeah. So, I mean, don't laugh about this, but, you know, one time we were walking out of the club, early on, we we're walking out of the club and, and this... Um, my son was like, mom, you look so beautiful. You're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. And then, and then he goes, Hey, can I have those M&Ms? And she goes, um, she goes, no, not until after dinner. And he goes, I told you seven times how beautiful you were. And, you know, and I, I know there's a funny side to that, yeah. but I said, Eric, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, and she goes for what, you know, we kind of have this funny, we were all laughing. And I said, because in the end, there's some, I want it to be real and heartfelt, mm -hmm. but in the end, in life, you get a lot more with sugar than you do with vinegar. So be nice to people and it's okay to give compliments, but they have to be real. So if you meant that to your mom, I'm very proud of you. But if you didn't, then you should evaluate like why you were saying that. But <laughs> I just encourage the kids to to treat people really well and to, and to act like leaders and to be accountable. And when they make mistakes, to own up to the mistakes. And by the way, that, that goes back to what I said, walk the walk. Like, you know, there's sometimes 
when as a parent where I get caught. In other words, like I'll say something and then I'll do something different. You know what yes. I mean? And it yes. happens to all of us and I admit that. But when that does happen, I don't try to say, well, I'm the parent. I can do whatever I want. No, I say, okay, in this scenario, I probably didn't do what I should have done or I should have said it differently from the beginning. And I kind of own up to it. And I say that one day you will have kids and you will be making these same decisions and they're not going to be easy. So I kind of bring it back down to their level so they can understand that we're all going to make mistakes there. There's probably not a perfect mom or perfect dad or perfect, you know, grandparents or what, but again, it goes back to that statement. There's a lot of good out there. And so it's what you choose to focus on and you know, that which you dwell upon, you become, what are you spending your days thinking about? You know, the person that cuts you off in the parking lot, you know, what you should have said to them or, you know, things that you're going to do with your kids tonight or the wooden pyramid or education nights or, you know, talking about leadership or, you know, all these different things that we have the opportunity to make a huge influence in, in their lives, to be very significant in their lives that can last them forever. But it starts with you, the leader of the family, the parent. Absolutely. I think this is a great final piece of advice to always remember that you are the leader of the family and at the same time, start raising your kids, keeping in mind that they will be tomorrow's future leaders. Real quick, real quick. I, I hope you don't mind because I just want to say this. And this is something that I just wanted you to think about. At the end of my speeches, I say, I ask them about legacy. And so I want to ask your viewers the same question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. And, and the question I ask is, because this question will be asked someday, how will your children describe you to their children? And then I make these CEOs write it out, like literally write it out. Not what they think they would say. In your wildest fantasy, what would you want them to say? Because one day that question is going to be asked, like, mom, dad, what was grandma really like? Mom, dad, what was grandpa really like? And I'm fascinated by the responses that I get because it'll be like, you know, hardworking or dedicated. But there's two words that I'm looking for. And I know that there's no right or wrong, absolute right or wrong, but there's two words that I'm looking for. And what's so sad to me is that out of all the, and these are parents, these are parents who are now CEOs. These are very successful people in their own lives. I'm looking for the word fun, that they were fun and the word love. And do you know that out of a hundred CEOs, maybe 10% will have love or fun on their list when they're talking about their legacy with their kids. And that's mm. sad to me. Wow. So I'm on a mission to change that because to be fun, to be described as fun in somebody's life, what do you actually have to be? Fun. You <laughs> nice. actually have to be fun. You know, it can't just be like, don't you remember the trip to the Grand Canyon 10 years ago? We were there for seven days for the love of God. No, you actually have to be fun on a regular basis. And so, and then to show love, like you actually have to show love, like hugs and we say, I love you all the time. No one ever hangs up a phone without saying, I love you. No one ever leaves the house without saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's just part of our culture that we've created. So I just challenge you, your, your, your listeners to, to answer that question. How will your children describe you to their children? Because that question will be asked, but then do it in this regard. Don't feel bad about what's happened to this date. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You can't change it, but you can absolutely change what's moving forward. You can make that answer happen. So if it's you know, that we took great trips together, that we had great adventures together, that we had love and fun and all these things, you can start making that happen today. And I just encourage you to do that because it's just a fun exercise and leave a lasting positive legacy. Absolutely. Don't forget that parenting should be a joyous journey, that Absolutely. childhood should be joyous, that you should have fun as a family and always uh, remember later that love that you shared because really that's uh, at the end of the day the most important things not you know the tutoring you're going to get your child or the college that you're going to try to get them in or, or whatever it, it is last week's homework those those are all a byproduct of all yes. the other things you've done yeah. i mean it's just like in business profit is a byproduct of how well you serve others well, successful, happy lives are a byproduct of how well you raise those kids and the love and the joy that you bring them. So I, I love your point, Anya. It is absolutely a, a, about bringing up them in a life of joy. Um, I'm, I'm writing a new book called Chasing Sunsets. Mm. And I'm doing that because every night, you know, we're fortunate to live uh, on the beach here. Um, every night I make the kids watch the sunset. And for years, I thought it was agony for them. And then my daughter was interviewed for Volleyball Magazine. And she goes, 
I love that my dad makes us appreciate sunsets every night. And I was like, what? They actually enjoy it. <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> you know, but, but I just don't want to miss those moments. And I want to, I want to find that joy. So I'm so thankful that you brought up that word because I think joy is a big part of it. Well, thank you so much, Dan. You've given us so much to think about. I think both as parents, as individuals, and also in a way we lead in our lives and as the way we lead with our families. So I hope we'll see you again soon. And I greatly appreciate everything you've shared with us today. Anya, thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. If you're enjoying this, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos.